Hello and welcome to part four of uh, this CAD systems exam preparation for the City and Guilds level three CAD exam. In part four, we're going to look at communication between hardware and software. And at the end of the video, we're going to look at how we would transfer CAD data from this CAD model. And we're going to transfer that into data that our 3D printer is going to understand in order to create the part. Now, there might be some discussion as to whether a 3D printer is a CNC machine. Um, however, I believe in quite a lot of aspects it's very similar. It may not be a traditional CNC machine, but this will allow us to show the principle of taking a CAD model, a virtual CAD model, and making it into a real life product. And it will be very similar to using a CNC machine tool, uh, a lathe, a mill, or a laser cutter. Okay, well, stay to the end of the video and you'll see that process in action. In this lesson, you are going to learn to identify how different computers can communicate with external hardware in a CAD CAM setup. So first question then before we jump in, what is CAD CAM? So CAD, you should all be aware of, is computer aided design. So it's creating that virtual model. CAM is computer aided manufacture. Now CAM can be considered as being either software or hardware and in this case I think CAM is referring to the hardware however the software version of CAM that's in the middle is a vitally important part of the link and that's the sort of thing that we'll look at today I'll also give you the opportunity to identify a couple of different CAD software file types um, and transfer data types and we'll pick those up a little bit towards the end so First off, why do we need computers to communicate with hardware? Well, let's look at this scenario on the right hand side here. So this is something typical in a modern manufacturing environment where you may have multiple computerized machinery. Now computerized and CNC machinery is much more beneficial for a business because the machines don't rely on a manual input of a user. Now I've worked in engineering scenarios where one operator has been in charge of between six and eight CNC machines at the same time. Now, obviously you can only do that under certain scenarios and if the programs are being run that are quite long. Um, however, that takes away the requirement to have six operators working at the same time if there were six CNC machines. Also, if the machine is running off a code Although it's not necessarily going to be perfect, the manufacturing that you get out of that machine is going to be a, uh, a lot more consistent than if you were having somebody manually programming these machines or manually making the parts. Now, most people watching this will have some experience of being in an engineering workshop and using a manual mill or a manual lathe. Now, just imagine if you could just set that machine up and hit go and the machine will do all the tool changes it needs and it will create all the features that it needs to create and it will do it sometimes 10 times quicker than what you could manage that. The only thing that the machine would be missing is an adaptive feedback mechanism where it could measure as it's going along. However, some modern manufacturing machines will actually do this. Um, and you can get probes and you can get lasers to measure parts as they're being created and those parts and the feedback that it gets will automatically adjust the machine as it's running. Um, you may learn a little bit more about that if you go on to look at this in any deeper level. However, let's just stick to this scenario we've got set up here on the right hand side. So we've got our CAD CAM workstation and this is creating our designs, it's got our models it's also got our CAM software on it and the CAM software, its job is to change the model data into a code that will tell 
the machine how to make these individual parts. And when we look at the 3D printing example later, you'll actually see that in action. So we've got a cam, CAD CAM workstation. We've got a server. Now, if you watch my previous lecture, you'd assume you should understand what a server is. So a server is basically a link up so that we could potentially have multiple CAD CAM workstations all linking through a server and that server will distribute data between the different machines whether that's a, a computer hardware or whether it's a machine hardware. Now that will often be done via a LAN which is a local area network and again that was in one of the previous lectures as well. That LAN would then send that information to a, dis a network distribution board and that network distribution board will send the data to the specific machine that it has been designed and been sent for. OK, so in engineering, we kind of term this uh, process as CAD, CAM, CNC. So CAD is the design of the models. CAM is the conversion of the CAD model into data that a machine would understand. And then CNC, computer numerically controlled machinery, which is why I count a 3D printer as a CNC, because it's computer numerically controlled. Um, that will then automatically make the parts for you. So just to run through this CAD CAM CNC process again. So the CAM software creates the toolpath programs for driving CNC machines to manufacture the CAD generated digital design. So we start with a digital design where we create the geometry that we need. That information is then passed forward into the CAM software where the toolpath is programmed and then that information is sent through to the CNC which will tell the machine how it should behave in order to create the features and the geometry from the original CAD model. We need to be considerate then of how we transfer data through this CAD, CAM and CNC cycle. Now, a piece of CAD software that creates potentially 3D or 2D part geometry will have its own file type. The software will be designed in a certain way to understand its own languages and its own programming. So when you save a file in a CAD software, it will save it as a specific type of file that that CAD software will understand. So when you open it back up, you get the full range of the software available for you to edit and save. So an example of this is in SOLIDWORKS. When you save a SOLIDWORKS file, it will save it as a proprietary SOLIDWORKS file type that will only work on SOLIDWORKS. When you open that file up, you get access to everything that you've previously done and you get access to all the different features within that software. If I was to try and open up that SOLIDWORKS file on AutoCAD, Sometimes it will open it up still and it will understand some of the things, but because it will call the different features different things and it will work in a different way, it won't fully understand everything that's in that file type. So CAD software, you can get file types, standardized file types that will work between all the different software, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get the full range of the features from the software that you initially created the part on. It will merely open up a geometry representation of the part that you made on a different CAD system. Okay, when you bring parts into a CAM software, the same things are there. So the CAM software is to act as that bridge between the CAD software and the, uh, the CAM machine, so the CNC machine. So the CAM software is there to convert the CAD data into the data that the machine will understand. This is usually done by something called a G or an M code. And when we look at the 3D printer later, you'll see that the 3D printer runs with G code. Now, you can program G and M codes manually. And at some point during a course or during a learning process, you will probably look and see how that's done. Because if you understand a bit of G code and a bit of M code, you can then easily modify those programs 
uh, that are on the machine or prior to them getting onto the machine, which can sometimes bring benefits. So when we save our data from CAD, we have to save it as a specific file type that the CAM software will understand. So the CAM software isn't, uh, doesn't really care about how the part was made. The CAM software focuses on the final geometry that's in that part. That's all it, uh, that's all it wants. So then the final one, the CNC, so the CNC machine will understand G and M codes, and there are lots of different coding formats as well. Uh, G and M codes are the standardized ones, I think, which are more commonly used, but different machines will use different code. That means that you will often have to have a specific CAM software that will write that, file, uh, that code type for the machine that this is going to go on. So let's say that you've got a Mazak CNC. Now Mazak use their own Mazatrol file type. So you wouldn't be able to program something in a CAM software that uses GNM code to run efficiently on a Mazak Mazatrol uh, machine because the coding types would be different. So you would therefore need a specific CAM software for the Mazatrol for it to write Mazatrol code. Um, I've just put on the bottom of here about a CMM. So a CMM is a coordinate measuring machine. And remember I mentioned earlier that you can get machines, you can get machines and you can get attachments to machines that will measure parts as they go. So the CMM will take physical data and it will transpose that physical data into something that the CAM software or the CNC all the CAD data will understand so it can make those adjustments. So we mentioned G and M code. This is a bit of G code. It's also using N code just to confuse you. So G, M and N. And um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know what all of these are. I know how to find it. I can look it up and figure out what it means. I can see down here, though, that G00 is telling the machine to do a movement in one or more axis. So this one is telling the Z axis to go to 0 0.1. Then on the next line of code, so the N is the line number, G00, so move, X2.5, Y2.5. And then again, G01. So G01 again will be something slightly different. And this time it's telling the Z axis to go minus 0.25. And F is usually a speed. So it's telling it to do it at a speed of 200. Now I don't know what all that means, but the machine that this bit of code is gonna go into will understand it perfectly and perfectly clear and it will know exactly what to do. So point of this slide, um, how can we transfer the data that we've created on our CAM software into the CAM machine itself? So how can we actually physically transfer that data? So once we've got this G code or M code created, how do we take it from the software and put it onto the hardware? Well, in the example that we looked at right at the beginning, where we talked about having a local area network and all the machines being connected up via a server, uh, that itself is called direct networking, where we are sending files from the machine and it will directly send it from the computer and it will directly send it to the machine that it needs to go to. Um, you can also do this with Wi-Fi. And so the only difference with Wi-Fi is that you won't have those physical cables, but you will have a little Wi-Fi hub that will send and receive the data. I don't need to go too far into Wi-Fi. You know what Wi-Fi is. Um, another way is to have a USB flash drive. So again, we looked at uh, ways of saving data in one of the previous videos. Um, and you can use that flash drive to save that G code. We can also use an SD card, which is what we do when we look at the 3D printer. You can save the file on there, give it a file name, take it to the machine, plug it into the machine and read the file off that flash drive or SD card. And again, similar, you could use a hard drive, an external hard drive. 
So we talked about what a hard drive was inside a computer in the, one of the first videos, and it's a long-term storage device. Um, you could have one of those hard drives mounted into an external case, and you go and plug that in typically with a USB cable, and you'd be able to read the files off that um, drive. And then the final method, which is probably the least common method, um, is to use a CD-ROM. Now, if you remember what CD-ROM stands for, it is write, it's not write, it is read-only memory, which means that you can't write on it once it's been written on. So you'd have a CD-ROM, once the CD-ROM has been written, um, it gets closed off and enclosed into a shell. You then take that CD-ROM and you can use it and reuse it as many times as you want, but you cannot write any more data on that CD-ROM. So if we're talking about moving files from a software to a hardware and we're going to stick it on a CD-ROM, that's probably the least efficient way of using, um, of transferring this data. Because more often than not, you'll start creating something and you'll realize that you need to go back and make some amendments. If you save that data onto a CD-ROM, that CD-ROM cannot be written on again. So it needs to be thrown away and you need to create another one. So all of the other methods here, you can reuse the data. Whereas a CD-ROM, once you've used it once, that's it. It's now time for the bin. Okay, so let's just go into these in a little bit more detail. So direct networking then is often done by an ethernet cable. So you take your computers and machines and you get them to communicate over a local area network and you connect them all together with physical cables. These physical cables are often ethernet cables and they have this RJ45 connector. You'll all see what you'll all understand what one of those is. If you see it, it's a little push connector with a pin in. Um, it looks like a little uh, a little transparent block usually, and you can have lots of different cables going into it, connected up. Typically, there's only one or two or three or four. That just connects into the back of a computer and it gets locked in with the little clip that it's got on it. Um, if you look inside of most laptops or on the back of a computer, you will often see an Ethernet connector. So it's quite uh, it's a very common type of connection. So in a CAD environment, then a LAN uh, a local area network using Ethernet cables can be connected to communicate code through different uh, PCs, a CNC, or whatever machinery you've got that you need to send and communicate uh, different bits of code with. This creates a permanent connection between the two. So it's a physical connection. It doesn't rely on anything apart from that cable um, and the RJ45 connector being good. So we mentioned a little bit of uh, a server previously. So a server is a hardware device that stores and processes computer data. Um, if you ever save anything into the cloud and you wonder what the internet is, the internet runs off servers. So information is uploaded onto a server. There are millions of servers all over the world. The information is stored on that server. It can also process things. So it's basically like a little computer, I suppose. Um, and the benefit of having that server is that the server can be left on all the time. Um, unlike a computer that might get used by different people and you might want to shut it down, the server will be a central hub and it will just continually run. If you want to see something, um, a bit of a wow, didn't expect that, Google the Google servers. And you'll see that these things are often contained in huge warehouses underground and there are thousands upon thousands of these rack mounted servers that are storing and processing data. So in a CAD scenario, a server may be used to connect multiple computers together and to act as a central storage device for models and drawings and for CAM programs. So you can save all that stuff on that central storage device. The benefit of that is that anyone that's connected to that, uh, that server can then pick up and utilize that data. And it's always gonna be available as long as the server is running. Now servers are very expensive 
um, which is why a lot of people nowadays are going to a cloud-based server. So a cloud server is a term that's used to describe a service that's provided over a network, typically uh, an internet network, um, where you will send your data through the digital network and it will get stalled on a remote server. So you're still using a server, but all you're doing is renting a bit of server space of somebody else. So if you use Google Docs, your information is stored on the internet. That internet is actually a server that's located somewhere in the world. Uh, you'll send your information up onto it via the internet and it will save it on a remote server. Now, the benefit of this is that it is very low cost and sometimes free and there is unlimited space. However, to get unlimited space, you will often have to pay. So if you think of something like Google Docs, I don't know if there's actually a, a limit on what you can save on there. Um, if any of you've got an Apple iPhone, you'll know that your stuff gets stored in the cloud. And once you've used up your five gigabytes of cloud space, then Apple will want you to pay for more. So this is because the, they have to pay for the actual servers and they have to pay for the maintenance of those servers. Um, the negative part of this is that a server requires an internet connection. If you don't have an internet connection, the server is not going to work. So in a CAD CAM scenario, if you were utilizing a cloud server and that cloud server went down because you didn't have any internet access, typically you may not be able to get access to your files. Okay, so let's take a quick look at a couple of file formats for CAD and CAM. So there are lots of different formats, as I mentioned um, previously. These formats are in most CAD software because these are generic ways to save the uh, to save the geometry of the part that you've created. Not it does not allow you to open up all the features of the software that you utilize to create the part. It's literally there to save the geometry. So we're just going to run through these very quickly. 3MF is the Microsoft's 3D manufacturing format. Uh, and again, you'll not again, uh, you'll find this with 3D printers quite often. Uh, a DXF is often utilized for 2D drawings. Now, most software will run DXF files. Uh, I used to work as a design engineer in a fabrication shop where we made parts out of sheet metal. I would design them in SolidWorks. I would then have to make the 3D parts flat patterned so that they could be cut on a laser profile before they were then shaped after that. So all the parts I created were then flat patterned and saved as a DXF file. So it's a 2D line drawing file format. A DWG, um, again, is a very popular file format. It's utilized by most CAD software. So you can save a part as a DWG. And again, it's more of a line drawing. It won't pick up all the features that you've used to create something, but you can transfer it from one CAD software into many others or into a CAM software. The next one, IGES, exactly the same initial graphics exchange specification a bit of a long winded title which is why we just call it IGES and IGES and step files do very very much the same thing as I've mentioned with some of the others they just store three-dimensional geometry of a part so you can use that with different software many many different types of software um, really good if you want to move a model from SOLIDWORKS into AutoCAD and you want to use some of the features in AutoCAD, then you can save it as another step file and bring it back into the software. Um, so if you go online and you download any CAD files, more often than not, you'll find that 
uh, they'll be saved as a step file or an IGES file. The final one, and the one that's used pretty dominantly in 3D printing, is an STL file, which is a stereolithographic data format. Um, again, it doesn't create things, uh, this doesn't create things in line geometry. It, this will actually break the model up into tiny little triangles. And you'll see a little snippet of that when we come into doing uh, a little video or, uh, of a process for doing 3D printing in a moment. OK, and here we are. So uh, a typical 3D printer process. We'll just quickly run through it and then I'm going to show you exactly what it is. So the first stage of the process will be to design the part in a CAD software, in a CAD system. That could be any CAD system. It doesn't matter what system you use, as long as you save the file as a .stl file, which is that stereolithographic file that we mentioned in the previous slide. This native CAD file format will be read by most CAM software. And again, this may be different when you're programming a, a you're, when you're utilizing a CAM software to program a CNC machine, a lathe or a mill. Um, this is, as we say, for a 3D printer process. So I would often create a part in a CAD system, save my part in that CAD system as a native CAD file for that software that I'm using. I will then save it a second time as an STL file. We'll then take that STL file and we'll open up the CAM software and bring the STL file into the CAM software We'll make some settings. We'll tell the software what we want the hardware to do. And then the CAM software will generate G code and it will save it in a text file format that we can then put onto an SD card. Then we take the SD card and we'll put it into the 3D printer. The 3D printer will read the text file line by line and tell the machine how to control itself to make the part that we initially designed. Once the part has been designed in your CAD system, and in this system we're using SOLIDWORKS, once the part is completed, we're now ready to save it so that we can take it into the CAM software. So I'm going to come up and hit File, Save As, and we're going to save this part as an STL file. Now different CAD software and different machines will utilize different file types but for 3D printing the STL file type which is a stereolithographic file type will cut the model up into little triangles and little bits of line data that the CAM software for 3D printers will understand. So I've selected STL I'm just going to pop this on the desktop and hit save. There we can see it's made 3,926 triangles and we can now find that software, uh, find that file. Uh, I'm going to close the CAD software down and I've opened up Ultimaker's Cura, which is a CAM software to convert our CAD model into G-code data that this 3D printer machine will understand. So from here, I'm gonna load up, there's my visor frame. I'm just gonna drop the visor frame on the screen. And if I rotate this around, you can see the visor sat flat against the build plate. So from this point, I can move this model around. I can change its scale if I wish. I can rotate it and spin it around. So I'm just going to pull this around slightly. There we go, just to show. Now, usually on 3D printing, we don't often print things square and straight. Well, if we print it on an angle, because of the nature of how a 3D printer works, sometimes it will give you a stronger print if it's printed on an angle. So uh, what else do we have? Uh, I can create a mirror image. I can um, 
tell the printer just some different settings here. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave all of those because I'm happy with where the model is. Next thing I'm going to do is tell it what machine I'm running. So I'm running an Automaker 2 Plus. The next thing I'm going to do is tell it the size of the nozzle. And, and these typically range from 0.25 up to 1 millimeter. And you can see this one's defined up to 0.8. So I'll select my 0.4 mil nozzle. It's going to give me a load of default values, but I've already put some customized values in, which I wish to keep for my model. Um, I'm also then going to tell it the material. And this is important because these different materials that you can use will all have different heat rates and different cooling rates as well. So inbuilt into uh, all the Automaker software, Cura, are all these different types of materials. So it makes it really easy to come and pick the material that you are going to use. So in this case, we're going to select PLA and blue. And PLA is a polylactic acid based plastic. Um, it's a very low mountain plastic and it's very similar. Uh, usually the same actually is the material that you get on the little blue, red and green milk carton tops. And sometimes in schools, uh, they have little collections and recycling of these milk carton tops and that's because PLA um, is a thermoplastic uh, material which means you can melt it back down and reuse it quite easily into and make something else maybe even filament to run in our 3d printer so I'm going to select the blue PLA uh, I'm just going to close that down because I don't want it to override my settings then I've got a big setting box here where I can change lots and lots of things and control exactly how that 3D print is going to happen. So I'm not going to play about with those right now because I've already tweaked some of the settings. So we know what machine we're using. We've got the part and it's sat on our build plate in the right place. Now, and we've got all our settings in. Now, when I hit this slice button here, it's going to bring all of these bits of data together and it's going to create the G code layer by layer that the machine will understand to create this part. So let's hit slice. It'll take a few seconds. There we go. So this is telling me now that to create this part with the settings that I've put on, it's going to take 56 minutes. It's going to use 14 grams of material, which is roughly 1.73 meters. So if we hit preview, we should now be able to see I'm just going to pull this bar down. You might not be able to see too much there. Let's scroll in a little. The movement settings on SolidWorks and Ultimaker are completely different, and I sometimes struggle with them to use the different ways. So if we scroll in now, I can clearly see the pathway of the 3D print and I can see all the lines and the infills that it's going to do. If I come down to this bottom box here now, if I come back, you will see here's the printer head. It will now show me exactly the tool path that the print head will take to manufacture our part. So you can see it's going to do uh, it's going to do some outer layers, but these are kind of inside outer layers. It will often do three outer layers and you can see it doesn't go all the way to the edge of the part here. Once it's done its third pass, uh, it will actually come all the way up to the edge. So all this space in between here is going to create what's called an infill and it will come through and it will just close all the gaps off. So we'll just watch this go round. I don't know if there's a way of making it go any faster. Um, let's just try and move this down, there we go. So we'll just watch this, I'll just fast forward it a little bit and see if we can get where we want to go. So it's now going to go around and create a second layer around the outside, a second wall. Then it's going to go around and create a third wall and if I just play it from here and zoom into where we are going, you should see that it's now, oh, 
but it's now making those lines thicker and thicker and you can see now that we're pretty much getting to the edge of the line the outline of our part and you can see it's a little bit of an optical illusion here because I've not got the part completely flat so let's just fast forward it again and I'll show you what the infill looks like there we go that's his fourth line so it's doing four outer layers I'm just going to show you the infill on this big bit here and show you what's happening so now if I come in here you can see it's extruding plastic to infill through those gaps to close them off now that's on layer one when it does layer two it will do pretty much the same but when it does its infill this time the infill will be perpendicular to the previous layer and that crisscrossing will allow there to be more strength and rigidity between those individual layers so let's flick it up to layer three and it will do the same but again we'll have the opposite perpendicular way and you can see it's going even going a different direction this time it's going from right to left where the first one went from left to right now an interesting thing that you can do with 3d printers is can you see now rather than creating this is solid inside here it's creating a mesh and just up here you can see this is called the infill so after it's done its initial layers and that's what one of the things that i set in the parameters i told it i wanted uh, there was three or four layers I can't remember for the top and the bottom you can everything else then rather than doing this completely solid is made with an infill now this infill even though it's only 20% is actually pretty darn strong and it's str uh, more often than not you don't need to have it as a solid infill this saves material it saves time in printing and it also reduces the weight so this clever little infill system just if i can rotate it around for you and we might be able to see it a little bit better this clever infill system there we go you can see the layers there see the infill layers there we go one two three four five on the sixth layer of infill um this is a real key element to 3d printing and the fact that we don't always have to have solid parts so let me jump up then it will do it'll eventually get to the top layer it should be three layers from the top and it will start closing that infill off there we go so it's put another layer on and it'll put another layer perpendicular to that one and then another layer perpendicular to that one and there we go so there are three layers on the top and what that's done is now created some g-code for our part so i'm going to save that to file i'm going to just put it on the desktop again uh, put it on the desktop there we go hit save that's saved as a g-code file so let's see if we can open that g-code file here it is oh I'll copy it into there so let's open this g-code file with a notepad it should just be a text file so here's the g-code so this is the data that the machine will understand so it's creating some definitions initially so we can see the nozzle diameter that we set um, and then we've got the g-code so each of these little bits of g-code will tell the machine to do something so g1 for instance is a motion so g1 let's have a look at this one g1 is telling it to move the x-axis to 32.174 the y-axis to 50.903 uh, and the e-axis which I would imagine is the height axis to 0 0.01383 so how many lines do you think it would take to make that part bearing in mind there were 17 layers should we have a look 
So let's go down and down and down and down and down and down. I'm just going to move this window in so you can see what I'm doing. We're still up here. So we'll keep coming down and down and down. Let's see what layer this is. So this is line 582. So let's go all the way to the bottom. So here we go, just a bit more data again. So the machine's probably not going to read this data here. This is probably going to be its end, and that's going to say switch off everything. So that is line 60,741. 60,741 bits of G code to create 17 layers of our part. Now it's possible to write this G code manually. That's for another day, and I don't think today you want to write 60,741. Anyway, what I can also do now is input a SD card into the computer. There we go, SD card. This now changes to save to removable drive because it wants me to save it to an SD card. I'm going to click on that, file saved, I'm going to hit eject, and then on the next page, the next video, I will show you how I take that, uh, that SD card and we'll put it in the machine and we'll start the machine up and we'll get it to run. At the machine, we'll switch it on. There we go. Insert our SD card where we saved our file. I'm just going to check we've got some material in our machine. So I'm going to go and hit print. And on here we can see the file that I've saved. And our 0.4mm nozzle. So I'm going to hit go. The machine's now reading the G code off the SD card. And it's going to heat up, heat the nozzle up. And then once it gets going, the G code will tell the head and the nozzle how it should move around to create the part. We can see the printers now ready to go. So moving the build plate up. It's doing an extrude just to purge the material so we can make sure that the material that comes out is fresh and new. And this is all being read off that G code. So now the nozzle it's going to start going around the exact path that we saw in Cura. Okay, you can just about see the blue outline on top of the machine. The, the slightly hazy build plate that you can see is from Prit stick being stuck on the build plate. And that helps the plastic stick to it on these initial layers. Having good adhesion between these first few layers is vital, otherwise the part can move and you'll end up with parts being printed that aren't quite as you would want them. So that's going to run and that will just happily run now for the next 58 minutes in order to create our part. At the end of it We'll turn out with a part that looks like so. And if we take a close look, we should see some of that layering that we saw in Cura. And you can see the outer walls and you can see the infill that it's done. I'm just going to show you a part, a part that's gone wrong. So here is a part that failed halfway through, and it failed because this end here wasn't stuck to the build plate, and I'd left it printing for a good half an hour before I identified it. But what this enables me to show you now is this infill that we have within our part. And you can see all those additional layers. So, there's our part. A couple of bits of plastic. I'm putting all of my might onto that and I can hardly bend it and break it. And the same with this one, it won't be quite as strong because we don't have that top and bottom layer. You can 
can see that actually that infill still makes that part quite strong. Okay, well I'm going to come back a bit later and hopefully this will turn into a usable part for us. Part, and you can, if you look at the uh, part closely, you'll be able to see some of the telltale signs that this part had been 3D printed. Um, you can see the little infills that were coming up here. I can see the outline of the walls. And then up here, we can again see the infill. We can see this little drag line, which isn't perfect. And I'll, I would look to try and move that line. And it's just where the head has moved from one side over to the other. And it's just caught the top of the part slightly. So I would go back in and change that program and just get it to move up slightly before it comes across and then move back down and then carry on doing its print. But it doesn't really matter for this part. Thank you. So as with all the other videos that we've created, there's a little bit of work for you now to do. So I want you to describe the use of each of these four to transfer data from a CAD software to a computer aided manufacturing system. So CAD, CAM, and then the CNC machinery. So how do we use direct networking to transfer our CAD data to the machine? How do we use Wi-Fi networking to transfer the CAD data to the machine? How do we use a memory stick to transfer the CAD data to the machine? And how can we use a hard drive to transfer the data to the machine? And number two, I want you to list six file formats that we can use to transfer CAD data into a CAM software. So from the CAD itself into the CAM software. And if you look back on the slides, you'll notice that we listed at least six of those. So just jot those down. Well done. You've reached the end.